Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the afternoon session. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Salman Nazarian, who is an expert in DM cardiac systems. Um, he has been uh, working in the field of myotonic dystrophy with, with patients uh, for the past 10 years, so we're delighted to have him here. Uh, he's going to make his presentation, and then at the end, uh, there should be some time for some questions. But uh, anyway, welcome. Well, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here um, for another uh, Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation meeting. Um, I appreciate every year the opportunity to meet with other experts and also with the, uh, with the patients who I learned from so much. I uh, really enjoyed the session this morning. So I'm going to talk about uh, cardiac symptoms in the setting of myotonic dystrophy. I'm not going to fill the whole hour uh, purposely so that we can um, discuss specific issues, any questions you might have. Do I have control over the slides with this? Yeah. Great, so the, my, my disclosure is nothing um, that uh, interacts with the topic we're talking about. So uh, the manifestations of uh, myotonic dystrophy uh, as far as cardiac symptoms are primarily due to infiltration of the heart tissue with fibrosis um, and with fatty infiltration when we look histologically at biopsy specimens. Um, there are also effects on cardiac conduction channels, and those are extremely important as well. In terms of symptoms, um, I'm going to show you the list of symptoms, and you can see on the right the, the frequency of these events, these symptoms, decreases as we go further. So uh, what are the typical uh, issues? So the most important issue and the most common is cardiac conduction disturbances and conduction block. So we're not talking about block of the coronary arteries, uh, although that can happen in myotonic dystrophy as well. You can have a heart attack from an artery that's blocked. But here, I'm talking about block of the electrical wiring of the conduction system that tells the heart it's time to beat. And that can occur quite often. In fact, I would say of the patients that I see, a great majority have either sinus node slowing, which can be just because of fibrosis or other effects on the sinus node where the impulses start that slow the heart rate, or they have some evidence of block at some point during the conduction system, which I'll dissect a little bit and show you. So this is extremely common, and it's what a cardiologist should focus on when you go to see them um, in terms of the primary cardiac issue that we deal with. Atrial fibrillation, atrial tachyarrhythmias in general, it could be atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, or atrial tachycardia, these are all cousins of each other. Atrial fibrillation mm -hmm. can uh, be a finding that's often observed, and um, atrial fibrillation can be very symptomatic, where you feel your heart rate being very, very fast and irregular, or it can be such that you don't feel it at all, and you show up at the doctor's office and they say, you're in atrial fibrillation. Regardless of whether it's symptomatic or not, it is important because atrial fibrillation can put you at risk for suffering a stroke, for having a blood clot that forms in the heart and then travels through the heart to the brain. So knowing that you have atrial fibrillation is extremely important. And in the setting of myotonic dystrophy, atrial fibrillation is very, very important because it tells you that it's an early sign that the heart is involved. What we know from large cohorts of patients with myotonic dystrophy that have, have been observed over time is that atrial fibrillation, among some other clues, but atrial fibrillation is one of the more powerful clues to expecting something to happen with the heart down the line. And that something is usually atrioventricular block. So if you see atrial fibrillation, if I see a patient come in with atrial fibrillation, I'm going to keep a much closer eye on their electrocardiogram to make sure that if things change, if things change rapidly, I 
go ahead and put in a pacemaker to protect from that eventuality, that possibility of atrioventricular block. So atrial fibrillation is important in and of itself because of the blood clot issue, but also it's important because it's a sign of potential further effects on the heart. Cardiac dysfunction, there are different um, measurements made on how many patients with myotonic dystrophy are affected with cardiac dysfunction. What do I mean by cardiac dysfunction? I mean when they look at your heart with the echocardiogram with the ultrasound to see how well it's squeezing, what we want is that 60% of the blood is pumped out of the heart each time. That's normal, too much can be bad too. We don't want 70, 80% pumped out each time. So 60% is normal. And if it's less than 50%, we call that cardiac dysfunction. The pump is not working well. And that can happen in our cohort of patients that we looked at, about 200 patients, we found about 10 to 11% of patients had cardiac dysfunction. But different cohorts have measured different rates. Overall, it tends to be less than 20%. And I think the different numbers come from the fact that there's some bias on who you look at, right? If, you, if we look at a population that's entirely asymptomatic, as far as heart symptoms go, and they've been sent just because of the fact that they have myotonic dystrophy and we want to monitor them, that incidence is lower. It's about 10 to 15 percent. But if you look at a population that's sent because they have symptoms, heart symptoms, and that's why they were sent, you'll see larger numbers. Why do I say this? Because the overall news is good. I think you should get evaluated, even if you don't have symptoms. But the chance of some of these worst things down the line, like heart dysfunction, is relatively low. 10% chance of all comers with myotonic dystrophy that cardiac dysfunction will ultimately be seen, meaning the heart pump is not working well. Now, we can deal with that if it comes, but the chance is low. So it's good to have surveillance for it. And then ventricular tachyarrhythmias. This is where the heart rate in the bottom chamber is so fast that the heart isn't pumping, it's just quivering, and, and you can have sudden death because of this. So sudden death can occur because of heart block, or it can happen because of rapid heart rates. These are, from our standpoint, very different because heart block is treated with a pacemaker, whereas ventricular tachyarrhythmia is really rapid heart rates are treated with a defibrillator. And that's why some of you, when you need a device, it's a pacemaker, some it's a defibrillator. Overall, the chance that you need just a pacemaker is much higher than the chance that a defibrillator is needed. But certainly, if we see any heart dysfunction, then we worry about the fast heart rates more, and we're more likely to recommend a defibrillator implantation, and I'll show a slide on the differences in these devices. So as far as um, the genetic basis of myotonic dystrophy, uh, I'm not a neurologist or a geneticist, so I won't spend too much time on this. I think everyone in the room knows this just as well as I do. Mm -hmm. Type 1, we have the CTG repeats. Um, we have uh, the number of repeats correlating with uh, the overall burden of disease. And the only reason I show this is to say that, on average, the number of repeats do correlate with the amount of cardiac symptoms as well, although it's not perfect. It's not necessarily that the more repeats you have, the more cardiac symptoms you will have. And um, type 2, the number of CCTG repeats don't tend to correlate with cardiac symptoms. So to the extent that they do, that's only applicable to type 1. Oh, go back. Now, as far as the mechanism of cardiac manifestations, um, essentially, uh, this is because of these repeat sequences. We used to think that they had direct effects because of the proteins that were produced from these. It's not the case. It's actually just the um, RNA. Um, and we don't need to go over the details of that. Um, but essentially, these, um, the RNA uh, that is created because of these repeats causes malfunction of other, um, other aspects of the cardiac mechanism, mechanism down the line. It can affect the chloride channel. I apologize. It can affect the chloride channel. It can affect the insulin receptor. 
And more recently, what we've found is that it, it can affect um, a gene called SCN5A, which is uh, heavily involved in the cardiac conduction system. Um, and so that can explain a lot of the issues that uh, we face in the con cardiac conduction system. These are um, some of them um, cause these issues because of problems that are created in the intercalated discs, which is where the majority of cardiac conduction channels are concentrated, where the two myocardial cells um, sit against each other. So these cells pass the conduction, pass the electricity to each other through these cardiac channels that I'm sort of trying to represent here. And uh, you know the current is, say, calcium ions that come into the cell, and then that is passed to the next cell and that's passed to the next cell, and that's how the cardiac conduction works. And if these cells misbehave, and the amounts of ion that's um, passed from one cell to the other are too much, too little, or take too long uh, to be conducted, that's when we find the issues occur. So I mentioned under um, biopsy specimens, we can see changes, so here is the area where the impulses, the electrical impulses in the top chamber start. We can see in the setting of myotonic dystrophy some fibrous tissues and some uh, fat uh, accumulation in the sinus node, and that tends to be associated with slower heart rates that I mentioned are very commonly seen. We can also see lymphocytic infiltration. Um, that's just inflammatory cells, our immune system fighting our own body. Um, we can see, again, extensive amounts of fibrosis in the atrioventricular node. That's another part of the conduction system that's lower down. I'll show a slide about that in a, in a second. And we can see, again, fibrous and fat uh, infiltration and atrophy is shrinkage of these cells that uh, enhance the conduction of impulses down to the bottom chamber. And then the bundle branches, these are the, the wires way down in the heart that helps synchronize the bottom chambers. And these bundle branches can also show some scarring, fibrosis, and some um, shrinking of the cells that end up reducing the rapid conduction that we like to see. And then finally, once you get to the cells themselves in the bottom chamber, the cells can also show some scarring and fat replacement. And this is what, in a small percentage, in about 10%, causes the heart dysfunction. And knowing this helps us detect it. I'll show you some work based on that. So how do we keep track of all these changes? The first thing that you do when you go see a doctor is uh, a cardiologist is have an EKG. And um, things have changed since this 1901 <laughs> system was developed by Eindhoven in, in um, uh, the Netherlands. Uh, so this system that he made was unbelievable. Uh, he put uh, two arms and a leg inside a water bath which were connected by these wires to a machine and it gave a readout of the heart's conduction. And I just saw one of the first EKGs that he produced. And I have to tell you, the quality was better than what we get in our clinic nowadays. It's amazing when you look at the history of all these things. It was only a single lead, but the quality was just unbelievable. And, and so now you don't have to use water baths. We put these sticky stickies on and uh, connect those to a uh, wire and for about six seconds you have to hold still until this is recorded and then we can look at that and get a measure of how the heart is conducting. And so what are we looking at when we uh, look at the conduction system? So here's a picture of the heart, um, the right top chamber, this is where the blood, the venous blood, the deoxygenated blood that our body has used comes back to the heart and then from get there, it gets pumped through this valve into the bottom chamber, the right bottom chamber, the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, it gets pumped into the lungs. This is the artery that goes into the lungs, the left and the right lung. And then from there, the lungs drain into the top of the left chamber, the left atrium. And from there down to the left ventricle, which then pumps it through the aorta to the whole body and to the brain. So that's where the blood flow goes. And in order to coordinate this blood flow, we get electrical signals to each of these chambers that tell them when to contract. 
So we want this top chamber and this ch top chamber mm -hmm. to contract at the same time first. And then after a delay, we want the bottom chambers to contract to make this work synchronously and perfectly. And the way that works is our impulses start from the sinus node, which is this area at the top of the right chamber. And then they travel to this relay station that slows the heart rate down, that slows the conduction down until they get to the bottom chamber. And when we do the EKG that, that's the, uh, that Dr. Eindhoven created, what we see on the paper when this electrical conduction happens is a little wiggle called the P wave. So that's telling us about the way this top chamber activates. How long does it take for it to be activated? And this is on the horizontal axis here is time. So the longer this takes, the longer it's taking to activate. Then once that conduction goes to the bottom chamber, we see a bigger wave. That makes sense because the bottom chamber has a lot more muscle and so it's gonna leave a bigger signature on the, on the voltage tracing on the paper. So again, time is on the horizontal axis and on the, uh, on the vertical axis is voltage. So the smaller chamber, the atria, have the smaller wiggle and then the bottom chamber, the ventricles, because they're so much thicker, they have so much mass, they have more voltage. So we see that here. And then what happens is the muscle relaxes. And as it relaxes, it also leaves a signature of that, those cells relaxing, which we call repolarizing, getting ready for the next beat to come. So this is essentially the signature for a single heartbeat that we see. And what we want to see is that the time it takes from the beginning of the atrium contracting to the bottom chamber is not too long, not too short either, but in myotonic dystrophy, the issue is not that it would be too short, it's that it would be too long. So we want to make sure that's not too long. And then we want to make sure the time that it takes to activate the whole ventricle, which is this larger wave, that's not too long either. There are other things we look at, but those are the main things. So this interval, this measurement from the beginning of that atrium activating to where you get to the big weight, that's the PR duration. And almost everyone, I would say, with the diagnosis of myotonic dystrophy type one at least, but even type two, a good number of people have prolongation of that interval. And in and of itself, if it's minimal, it doesn't mean much. We have to just watch it carefully. But if that's, Normal is 200 milliseconds, one-fifth of a second. If that's more than 240 milliseconds, that's when we start to worry a little bit that it's taking too long, that that, that may lead to complete conduction block, which can be dangerous. And then the QRS duration, that's the activation of the bottom chambers. And we look at that as well. Um, and normal for that is less than 80 maybe around 90, can be an upper limit of normal. And if it's above 120, that's sort of the limit where we say, that's getting too long. We need to worry about that. And you can see the numbers here. So if I look at our, the, our population, this was um, about 170 patients. We saw 70% had PR duration prolongation. That's first degree AV block, you might hear it. First degree heart block, 70% and about 30% had a long um, QRS duration, which is the bottom chamber activation. And you can see that there's a good spread of um, uh, measurements on first evaluation. This was the first time we met a patient with myotonic dystrophy um, in terms of the PR duration. A lot of people with prolonged QRS, uh, PR duration, and then uh, QRS duration as well. Remember I said a AD and below is normal. You can see a fair number of people with measurements above 100 here. And what happens over time? So that's the good news. It's not always increasing. Um, this, these are, if you look at this graph, each line is a patient's measurements over time. So we have 2,000 days here. So. Um, number of years of follow-up with separate measurements at each time point. And you can see that 
a lot of people just had a flat, cur flat curve. It doesn't really increase. Some people, it even decreases. The conduction gets faster, right? If the interval shortens, the conduction is getting faster. So it's not necessarily that it's going to progress. But then this is the worrisome part. You see these patients that have a line that rapidly goes up, or even within a day, the lines go up. So you can see there are different tra trajectories, and that's why this is a difficult issue. Everyone is different. Some people don't progress at all. Some people, the intervals actually get better. In some people, it progresses. And we've tried very hard to, tr uh, to figure out who's at risk for this kind of pattern, where we need to put in a pacemaker before this gets to, you know, it doesn't conduct anymore. Um, and it's very hard to know that. The best measurement is actually on two subsequent visits, what is that slope? If it's, you know, if you get a sense that this, this measure is here, the second measure is here, the third measure is here, then I, have, then I feel pretty confident I can watch this patient. It's going to be okay. Things aren't moving that fast. But if I meet a patient on day one and they have this EKG and on day, say, I meet them next year and they have this EKG, that's the patient I'm going to worry about and put in a pacemaker early because the slope of the line is headed the wrong way. I, I want to prevent complete heart block. And the same thing is through uh, true for the QRS interval. That's the measure of how long it takes to go across both ventricles. And you can see here as well that most people are stable, but then you have these outliers that have a very rapid progression, like this patient here or this. And so, again, the slope of the line helps, but it's not the end-all be-all. If you just get an EKG here and not see them for two years, you can miss the change. And that's why it's so important to have yearly visits at least, you know, um, yearly visits with a cardiologist, but primary care doctors can get EKGs as well and, and, and make sure that we know what, where this line is headed so that we can preempt changes that might become symptomatic. And if you have lightheadedness or if you pass out, those are signs that things may have changed since the last time you saw your doctor. That's why you're having lightheadedness, because the cardiac conduction system isn't normal anymore. So very important to report that lightheadedness or, or passing out. Now the QTC interval is that repolarization interval. It's the heart getting ready for the next beat. I didn't talk about this a whole lot. Um, I think it's less important than we used to think in the setting of myotonic dystrophy itself, but it can be important with certain drugs. So mexilatine is a drug that, that is used in the setting of myotonic dystrophy. I'm sure some in the room are taking mexilatine, and that's a drug that can affect the, the repolarization system as well as the conduction. And so if you have a prescription for mexilatine, it's very important that you've seen a cardiologist that your electrocardiogram in those first few weeks that you're taking it is checked a couple of times. If I start mexilatine, I usually check an electrocardiogram when I start it a week later just to make sure these intervals don't change too much so that I can uh, be prepared for anything we might do or uh, the, the, the drug might do or potentially stop the drug if I see too many changes happening. Uh, now, one of the uh, things that you will have done, um, I typically do this if it's normal on the first time that I meet the patient every three years, at least every three years, an echocardiogram is helpful. And at first evaluation by a cardiologist, it's a must. Why is that? Because uh, let's see if the video plays. This is a test that looks, like the, looks at the heart function. So you lie on your left side generally. It's not a painful test, it's an ultrasound, so sound waves being sent through the skin. So the technologist holds the probe here, and um, these sound waves go through the body, and they reflect off structures. And so they can show how well the heart is squeezing. Sort of similar to the picture I drew before, but upside down. So the left ventricle here, the left atrium here, right ventricle here, right atrium here and you can get a sense of how well the heart is squeezing. This is where we get that number of 60% or more usually. So in this patient, the heart function is normal. Sometimes the pictures are beautiful. I didn't show you the most beautiful picture because this is what we deal with sometimes. We can't see perfectly. But we get a good sense of how the heart is functioning. There are better tests that show us better pictures. I'll show you one of those later on. Uh, remember this picture and how it looks, and we'll compare it to the other one so that you see why sometimes we order that. <coughs> 
But this is a good place to start, to see what the heart function is like. How does it work? Do we have to worry about heart dysfunction? If the heart isn't contracting well, what are the symptoms? That's very variable too. I have patients with a heart function of 15%, normal being 60%, 15%. That function just fine. They have no shortness of breath, no fatigue, doing really well. And then I have patients with a heart function of 40% or 35%, much better than the patient with 15%, lower than 60%, and they're just not functioning at all. They have a lot of swelling in their legs, they have shortness of breath, they have fatigue, they wake up at night uh, gasping for air. And it just goes to tell you that our measurements aren't perfect, right? It's not. Uh, just the measurement that I look at here is a single measurement about how this heart is squeezing. But that can be affected by many different things. It can be because it's not squeezing well because the blood pressure is high. Well, in that situation, the symptoms aren't usually as, as bad. But if the blood pressure is low and it's not squeezing, things are much worse. And when we look at the number of how it's squeezing, all we're looking at is how it's squeezing. We're not looking at all the other loading conditions and things that affect the heart. And so it's just a single measurement, which is pretty good, but it's not perfect. If you look at patients with myotonic dystrophy, you can see that the great majority at first evaluation have a normal function, or near normal. It's pretty rare at first evaluation to have these numbers, like 10% or 15 or 20%. We have some in the 40% range. So important to have this at first evaluation and every couple of years, more often if symptoms change, <clears throat> um, just to keep an eye on that and make sure we don't need to treat heart dysfunction. There are medications to treat heart dysfunction. Sometimes it's a vascular issue. Sometimes it's because there's been a heart attack. The heart isn't getting enough blood flow. So if we see this, we generally evaluate to make sure you don't have lack of blood flow to parts of the heart. And sometimes it's because of rapid heart rates, because of atrial fibrillation, because of other arrhythmias that are causing the heart to work too hard. And treating the atrial arrhythmia actually helps this. Let's look at another cohort. I showed you some results from ours, um, but this is a larger, much larger cohort. So the, the nice thing about Scandinavian countries, this data is from Denmark, is that they have a single payer system, so everyone has records in the same system, and it really helps them um, to track um, patient outcomes and patient treatments very easily. Of course, it has other benefits too, but um, this is one of the main things. So they could look back, this cohort, they looked all the way back to 1977, and they analyzed the data at 2011. And they found that they had 1,146 patients with myotonic dystrophy. It's one of the largest cohorts ever reported, and for about 500 of these patients, they had genetic testing with uh, type 1 um, myotonic dystrophy. You can see that the, um, the ages between these is relatively comparable, um, uh, and the age at diagnosis, there are some changes. Those with confirmed type 1 had a little bit earlier diagnosis than the others, um, and calendar years of diagnosis are similar. And what I wanted to show you this for is primarily this graph. <clears throat> they calculated these things called the standard incidence ratio compared to background populations. So obviously, they didn't, this wasn't a randomized prospective study. They're looking at data later on. And they want to compare rates of cardiac diagnoses in these patients compared to matched people without myotonic dystrophy. What do I mean by matched? I mean in every, day, in every way that they could match characteristics, including age, gender, other conditions like diabetes, they matched patients so that they could look at a patient with myotonic dystrophy and compare them to a patient that had all other similar characteristics except having myotonic dystrophy. And when they did this kind of analysis, they find that those with myotonic dystrophy were 15 times more likely to have uh, these cardiac conditions, cardiomyopathy, conduction disorders, arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation, and needing a device or having heart failure. So it is definitely true that myotonic dystrophy, both type 1 and type 2, um, increase the odds of having some sort of cardiac issue. And 
notice this, this is by year of diagnosis. Most of the time when this was gonna happen, it was in the first year, within the first year of diagnosis. And the chances of it decreased over time. So if you are diagnosed with myotonic dystrophy because of symptoms, because I think at the time this cohort started, they weren't diagnosing it so much before the symptoms occurred. The odds of having cardiac disease are highest in that first year. Doesn't mean you shouldn't get checked every year. You should because it's a progressive disease and things can change. But the chance of bad things happening decreases over time because the more you watch, the more data you develop that things are stable, the more that makes us feel better that, um, that we're not gonna have to worry about some of the more dangerous things or the more we can prevent them, more likely. So that is a, that is a important finding that they showed here. And this shows the chances by age, and you can see again, the odds are higher, they're above one, no matter what age category you're in, but the odds are 20-fold in the younger group. And this is a little bit biased, right, because patients that are diagnosed at a younger age have likely higher chances of having other organs be involved, in, including the heart. So the chances are elevated compared to, compare, co compared to control groups at any age, but highest at the younger ages. So we have to be vigilant in our, in our young patients in particular. Now I mentioned most sudden deaths, if they occur, are due to heart block, atrioventricular block, where the top chamber stops conducting to the bottom chamber. In that situation, all we need is a pacemaker. So we make a small incision, about two finger breaths, just over an inch, um, and underneath the left clavicle. We can do it also on the right, but generally the left is preferred. And uh, we pass wires through the blood vessels that run draining the arm into the heart. So this is not open heart surgery. It's just an incision up here and then the wires are passed into the heart. One wire in the top, one wire in the bottom. In some cases, you may need another wire that goes to the left ventricle, but that's generally if there's heart dysfunction. Usually just two wires. And, uh, and then once we attach these to the heart muscle, attach the other end to the battery, we close this up and all you have is an incision here. In general, it's not something that's noticeable. Um, most patients tell me that they forget it's there after some time. Um, the pain is, it, there is some pain, but it's not severe. We generally control it um, with milder pain medications for the first few days, and then it subsides. The main risk is chance of bleeding when we make the incision here. Um, about one in a hundred chance of bleeding unless you're on blood thinners. Uh, chance of damaging the lung behind where we're working. So that can happen where the lung is collapsed. That's about one in 500 chance. And worse things like bleeding around the heart, one in 500 to one in a thousand, very rare. And worse things than that, extremely rare. One in a thousand, say, risk of heart attack or dying. Um, those are the primary issues that can happen with pacemaker implantation. Most of the time patients do fine, go home the next day, and um, it's a safe procedure that can help tremendously, particularly by mitigating, completely getting rid of um, the risk of dying suddenly due to heart block. So if there are signs that the conduction system is progressing to have a lot of disease, it's important to go ahead and have this done and it's, as far as procedures go, very, very safe. Now, if the heart function is abnormal, or if you've had evidence of ventricular tachycardia, meaning faster heart rates in the bottom chambers, then a defibrillator would be used. So what's the difference? A defibrillator has every function of a pacemaker, but it also has the, cap the capability of giving a shock to the heart. So if it senses a fast heart rate, it'll shock the heart and reset the heart rhythm to the normal rhythm. Whereas a pacemaker, all it does is if it sees the heart is beating too slowly, it'll speed up the heart. So this speeds up the heart, the pacemaker. This can speed it up, but it can also slow it down. 
So you could say then why not just give a defibrillator to everyone? And that is a question we, we ask ourselves too, but when we look at patients with myotonic dystrophy, we see that most patients, the great majority, I would say 95% of patients, maybe more, 97, only need the pacing function. And why not give it just in case? Well, because it's a bigger device, it's bulkier, it has more electronics, more pieces and parts that can fail. And if it get, ever gets infected, it's harder to pull these defibrillator wires out of the heart than these pacers, because if you ever get one of these infected, the whole thing has to come out. It's very hard to treat these with just antibiotics. You have to take them out and replace them. So there are definitely good reasons to not put in a defibrillator if you don't need it. But if we're on the borderline of wondering if you may need protection from rapid heart rates, we do offer defibrillators, and I've certainly implanted them in some of my patients because of that worry. Mainly that reason would be if the heart function is abnormal or if you've had someone in your family die of a rapid heart rate. So let's look at some data again. This is again the cohort I've been talking about just to show you what the average uh, uh, findings at baseline were. Uh, age at diagnosis for most of our patients was young in the 40s. These were again diagnosis, no cardiac symptoms sent to us for evaluation. Um, the majority are type 1 patients, some type 2 patients. Uh, family history of sudden death in 31%. This is, of course, a little bit mixed. It's not all sudden cardiac death. There are other issues to be worried about, but some of these we worry may have been cardiac issues. And here's mexilatine that I mentioned, 22 patients, 13% on mexilatine on uh, referral to us. As I mentioned, um, the uh, incidence of heart dysfunction was about 11 to 12%, 12%. Um, here are those intervals that I mentioned that are very important. The PR interval on average was actually in the normal range, but you can see with the standard deviation that a lot of them have prolonged um, first the gravy block, and then the QRS is abnormal on average. Um, 90 or 80 being the normal, and this the average was is 109 in our group of patients. Now in this group, if we look at what predicts heart dysfunction, <clears throat> so the things that predicted are these with the smallest numbers, smallest p-values, this column, so 0 0.02. So type two is less likely, it's a negative number, less likely to be associated with heart dysfunction. So if you have type one, you need more watchful examination of the heart function. The other one that is positive is the QRS interval. So the longer the QRS interval, the more likely that the ejection fraction is lower. And so if we see that the QRS interval is prolonged, we're gonna be much more careful and follow those patients. Um, now this is predictors for changes in the EKG. And the, the most important one is the PR and the QRS, so I'll just focus on those. So the things that are important are that being female is actually protective, being male increases the odds of heart block, being older increases the odds, time since diagnosis in our cohort was associated with it, and then as I mentioned before, this is a huge uh, number, plus 45 uh, for paroxysmal atrial arrhythmia. So if you have an atrial arrhythmia, you need much more vigilant monitoring. Very, very important. Um, and then as far as QRS interval, uh, the number of repeats was associated in type one. Family history is important. And again, atrial arrhythmias. So atrial arrhythmias keep coming in different cohorts, including ours, as one of the most important things that need to be watched. This is um, Bill Gros. Bill Gros is a cardiologist as well who is uh, very involved in myotonic dystrophy, has been in this conference previously. <clears throat> and uh, his data, which were published in 2008, showed also atrial arrhythmias are strong predictors. So if you have atrial fibrillation, this is the situation where putting in a pacemaker early may be important, or the fibrillator. And uh, again, these electrocardiogram abnormalities that we look for. <clears throat> 
So atrial fibrillation, I mentioned a little bit, um, it's possibly because of regional fibrosis inside the heart, in the, inside the top chamber. It's likely exacerbated by sleep apnea, which of course, as you know, is very important um, when you have myotonic dystrophy that you have sleep apnea treated. Uh, I send almost all my patients with atrial fibrillation, whether they have myotonic dystrophy or not, for sleep evaluation. And I think um, <clears throat> the use of CPAP or BiPAP can be very helpful for getting rid of the atrial fibrillation as well. And then age and male gender are also associated with uh, atrial fibrillation. So what does that mean in terms of the diagram that we drew here? Remember, the impulses start from the top in the right chamber and go in a straight line to the AV node and then from there to the bottom chambers. It's like a metronome. It's regular, very orderly. When we have atrial fibrillation, the bottom chambers are activated the same way, but the top chamber is just these chaotic little wavelets everywhere. And so you have tons of wavelets. The top chamber is going at about 300 beats per minute, believe it or not. And um, that means it's going so fast that it's not pumping, it's just quivering. And that's why we're at risk for stroke when we're in atrial fibrillation, because this top chamber um, is just quivering. Blood can pull here, form a blood clot and then from there go to the ventricle and out the aorta to the brain. So we're at risk for stroke or embolism to other organs. And so if you have atrial fibrillation, it's important to figure out whether you need a blood thinner to prevent that risk of stroke. This is what it looks like on the EKG. You can't see those nice P waves, those small um, P waves that came regularly before each of these big ones that I showed earlier and the rhythm is irregular. You can see that this interval between these two is very different than this one. It's very different than this one. It's irregular timing. So it's fast, it's irregular, and we don't have those P waves. That's atrial fibrillation. Usually associated with palpitations and fatigue, but everybody has different sensations. I've heard people say it's like a fish flopping in my chest. People uh, can wake up at night urinating more, which is, of course, part of being a man and getting older, but it can be exacerbated by atrial fibrillation. Um, you can have shortness of breath. Um, all sorts of symptoms can be uh, due to this. And stroke, I mentioned, the most important issue. So how can we monitor all these things? I, I mentioned an EKG every year with your cardiologist or primary care physician. Um, but an EKG is just a quick snapshot at six seconds. We want to make sure that overnight or longer durations, we don't have other arrhythmias that come and go that we might miss. If I monitor you for six seconds and you don't have atrial fibrillation, that's good. But I want to make sure that if I monitor you longer, you don't have atrial fibrillation either. And so how long is long enough? That's hard to answer. So we, we used to do mostly 24 hours. Then we did some 48 hours. Then we started doing seven days. Then 30 days, it, they can be bulky, they can be hard to wear, and, um, but still most of the time that's enough. In patients that say they have symptoms, palpitations, lightheadedness, things that I can't explain, and I get up to seven days, say, and I see nothing. In those cases, then if I'm really worried and I see nothing, I consider putting one of these in. So implantable loop monitors. There are, now, uh, there are now different companies making them. This is just one brand of them, but they're all about the same size. So here's, here's a paper clip. You can see it's quite small, like a paper clip. And we can inject this under the skin right overlying the heart, and no need for sedation, no need for general anesthesia, just a little bit of lidocaine, like when you go to the dentist. It's injected under the heart. It's washing your heart. 24-7, and we can leave it for about three years in the body, three to four years. And so it's really the best way to monitor a patient if we're worried about them. And I have plenty of patients where I've inserted one of these. Just the other week, um, one of my patients who was having symptoms I couldn't catch on a standard monitor um, because her symptoms happened once a year or so, had symptoms, and she ended up having 15 seconds of no heartbeats and then came back. And so this is very helpful in that kind of situation where if we put a monitor, the chances of catching one of those events that happens once a year or so is very small. So it's really been, been helpful. 
And um, I think it's, it's good to consider using it in the setting of myotonic dystrophy. We used to do a lot of what's called signal average DCG. You don't see it as much anymore, and I'm not a proponent of doing it anymore, particularly in myotonic dystrophy. What's the concept of the test? It's, um, it's that what we're looking for is slow conduction. Um, and if we put this EKG, which is similar to the ECG, you would have normally for six seconds, but we do it for about five minutes. And then we put all the signals on top of each other and average them out. And what that does is give us more resolution for this end stuff to see if there's any areas of delayed activation in the heart, meaning slow conduction going through fibrosis or fat. And we thought it would be very, very useful in many conditions, and it has been in some. But in myotonic dystrophy, it tends not to be so useful. So I've stopped using it for my patients. I don't think many people are using this anymore. What are, what are the other things we can do? You might have a cardiologist that says it's time to do an electrophysiology study. So that's where it's like a catheterization where they're looking at the coronary arteries with an angiogram. Um, so we go with catheters through the leg. Um, and these catheters all have electrical um, bipoles, electrodes at the tip of them. And we put them in these different places near the important uh, structures for the cardiac conduction. What's the point? It's to look at the time it takes for these impulses tra to travel from one place to another. I told you that from the surface EKG, which you, you can see up here, from the P wave to the QRS, the activation of the top chambers to the bottom chambers, we get a pretty good idea if there's conduction disease. But we don't really know if this is long because of the conduction here, or here, and that tends, turns out to be critical because if it's long, if that interval is long because of the conduction being slow here, it doesn't mean a whole lot. But if it's long because of the conduction being slow here, it's dangerous, it's unstable. And so there are situations where we say, we're just not sure, let's do an electrophysiology and find out, electrophysiology study to find out. This is one of my patients with myotonic dystrophy. And, um, the intervals in the bottom part, which is here, are extremely long. Um, in fact, I don't think I've ever seen intervals this long outside of myotonic dystrophy because of its propensity to affect this early part of the important part of the conduction system. And when we see that, that's an automatic, you need a pacemaker, this is not stable. So it can be very helpful when we're in doubt as far as whether a pacemaker is gonna be helpful or not. What about for tickling the heart to see if we can induce fast heart rate? So here you can see this is, we have a catheter in the bottom chamber, and what's happening is these are just extra beats that are kind of just like exactly irritating the heart a little, tickling the heart a little to see if we can make it go into this rapid, dangerous heart rate. Well, we used to do a lot of that, and I, I, I don't know. I think the jury's out whether it's helpful or not, because we can induce arrhythmias and certainly if we induce them, we're gonna worry. If we tickle the heart and it goes into that, we're gonna worry and say you need a defibrillator. Whether that predicts future events or not <clears throat> is not clear. There is some data. Um, this is an example of something that was induced in a patient that was having the arrhythmia, and it's, I, I showed this just to show that some of these we can cure. This is a very specific rapid heart rate of the bottom chamber called Bonder branch reentry, which is actually something we see in myotonic dystrophy and we can cure it with an ablation lesion. So in people that are having shocks, that are passing out because of ventricular tachycardia, it's extremely useful to do this. But whether it's helpful to just test for it to see if you need a defibrillator, we do it, I do it if I'm really worried um, and it's based on this data from France that was published in 2012. They have a, in Paris, at, the, uh, at one of the big hospitals in Paris, they have a large cohort of patients with myotonic dystrophy. And one of the experts there is a proponent of doing these EP studies. And uh, so he enrolled uh, a number of patients, older patients, well, older, greater than 18 years of age with type one. And you can see the, his data here. So. 914 patients. Now he's looking at this, not prospectively, but looking back at what was done. And there's some differences 
in terms of how we interpret the data. So these were 914 patients that over several years he had done and he was looking at later. Um, some had a completely normal EKG, so they didn't have anything done. And then 486 of them had either or both of these ECG abnormalities, the PR interval, the top part being prolonged, or the bottom, the ventricles, taking too long to activate. So in those patients, he basically just put in a pacer or did what was needed to take care of the ones that had um, issues initially that made it clear that they should have a pacemaker. But in those that didn't have any of those issues, he divided them into two strategies. Invasive, where he did the EP study, the electrophysiology study with the catheters to study the intervals and do the tickling to see if they're prone to rapid heart rates. And then a group where no, non, no invasive testing was done, just observation was done. And uh, in that group, he put in pacers only when they developed symptoms, the non-invasive group. In the invasive group, he did the electrophysiology study. And if there was long intervals, like the patient I showed you I had, he put in a pacemaker. If he could tickle the heart into a rapid, dangerous heart rate, he put in a defibrillator. And otherwise, he did nothing, and he watched them. And so the big question with this kind of data is, how was the decision made to go with the non-invasive group versus the invasive group, right? Because that's often hard to tell, even subconsciously. If I worry about someone and I'm offering these two, I may suggest that they go with the invasive group. And so you end up putting patients that are a little bit at high risk, higher risk in one group or the other. So they're not perfectly equal groups because it retrospective data. It's not randomized. Patients aren't randomized to one or the other. So we can't draw full conclusions on this. But for what it's worth, what he shows is that those patients that had invasive testing with the electrophysiology study had a lower chance of sudden death over follow-up. And that's why nowadays we do invasive testing, electrophysiology testing, certainly if we're worried about patients, just to make sure that there's no reason to have a defibrillator or an early pacemaker. Here's um, a test I wanted to show you, the echocardiogram I showed you earlier, the pictures, if you remember, were a little bit fuzzy. I, unfortunately, it looks like I can't play the video. Are you able to play the video for me by any chance, or is the file not there? But if it doesn't show, um, the point is just that it's a much clearer image. So in cases where we can't see the heart well, we can get a much nicer image and understand better how the squeeze of the heart is working, how the valves are functioning, and even see scar within the heart. That's in this next image. An echocardiogram can't see scar, whereas with an MRI, we can look for areas of scar with great detail inside the heart, and that can potentially change management, although not enough data, really, in myotonic dystrophy to absolutely say we need to get an MRI on every patient. Certainly, if there is heart dysfunction and ventricular arrhythmias, it is helpful. And there are newer methods we're working on in terms of finding small and diffuse areas of scar. This is something called T1 mapping, where we can look at the presence of diffuse scar in the heart. We know that um, it works very well for standard uh, cardiomyopathies, and in our cohort of patients, uh, patients with myotonic dystrophy compared to our healthy volunteers had a very different signal. So we are using this to see if we can predict future events, but we have to do more work to, to figure out if that's going to be part of the standard recommendations. So the things that we've found so far uh, we see on MRI are that uh, the volumes tend to be bigger if you have myotonic dystrophy. Um, the cardiac index, how much blood is getting pumped, index to body sides is affected, and there's some evidence of very uh, small amounts of diffuse scar that we can pick up on MRI, and that these um, small amounts of scar are associated with the EKG changes. So, as I mentioned, more work is needed before we can see if they can predict future, future events. So what's our current evaluation scheme um, in patients with myotonic dystrophy? I think this is towards the end of my talk. Hopefully I'm not running over. 
Um, we start when we meet uh, a patient with a new diagnosis, with a physical exam, history. It's very important. Be sure to tell your cardiologist if you have had lightheadedness, if you've had palpitations. It's good to try and tap out the characteristics of those palpitations. Is it regular? Is it irregular? I think it's very helpful to remember those things. Does it start suddenly, stop suddenly? Does it start gradually, stop gradually, or vice versa? So history, physical examination, and an electrocardiogram, an echocardiogram, and a halter, and in some cases an MRI can be very helpful. If all of those are normal, then we go to every year ECG and Holter, and every few years an echocardiogram. That's the current practice. If, these, if any of these are <coughs> showing abnormalities, then we think about either a pacemaker or a defibrillator. So if there's atrioventricular block, just a pacemaker. If the heart function is abnormal, squeezing less than 35% of the blood, a defibrillator. If we see evidence of spontaneous sustained arrhythmias, a defibrillator. And then if we have borderline abnormalities, if we see intervals that are particularly long but not fully blocked, or if we have arrhythmias that are important we know are associated with events, or if we see some heart dysfunction but not severe enough to warrant standard uh, placement of a defibrillator or pacemaker, then we think about an EP study, electrophysiology study. If someone tells me I really don't want to have an invasive test, it's a discussion. It's not something that is absolutely necessary. As I showed you, the data aren't perfect. So if you tell me you don't want to have an invasive test, I think that's fine. Now we have a pretty good option in using an implantable monitor because then we can have full monitoring of your heart. And I think it's a reasonable substitute if you really don't want an invasive test. So we do that, and if everything is normal, we go back to standard yearly checks. And if we find abnormalities, uh, that warrant devices, then we go that way. So that's the current standard. I think yearly evaluations are very important and paying attention to your symptoms. I'll summarize there. So um, with myotonic dystrophy, particular type 1, a third of deaths are sudden, and they can be prevented if, if we're vigilant about the signs that are important. They, most of them are related to heart block, conduction system disease. Um, in patients with atrial fibrillation and ECG abnormalities that suggest slow conduction, um, we have to either think about putting in a device or doing an electrophysiology study or a monitor. The rule for ICDs is unclear, but they're, it's unquestionably important in a small subset of patients, and we don't have the small subset perfectly tuned, so sometimes we are on the side of being careful to protect you. So I'll stop there and would love to take questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, just in the context of time, if you do have questions, please write them on the cards and uh, we'll come pick them up at the end. Uh, Dr. Nazarin, thank you so much. That was fabulous discussion on a very important matter for all of us. Um, what I'd like to do now is ask the panelists for the patient report out session uh, should just meet on the left of the stage and we're going to go straight straight into sorry that that left uh, of the stage um, and we're just going to move straight into the next session. <laughs>